we're getting fancy. Maybe the quality of the recording will be better and things like that. Welcome back. It's so nice to have you back again. And I have a fun lesson recorded or planned for today. Um, so today's color lesson will include, we're going to do a couple color wheels and sort of talk about why they're different. Um, and we're also going to sort of discover why when you mix a red and a blue, sometimes you get brown and sometimes you get a really beautiful clear amethyst purple. We're going to talk about why you mix around the color wheel and um, a little bit about the relationship between color and value. And I know that if you're one of my regular students, you've heard this before, but I really feel like it's foundational to understanding color at a really lovely lesson. Fanny, you'll notice you don't have to speak up, um, but you'll notice that I did press record. So don't unpress record. Um, <laughs> uh, and then we'll, we'll put it to work and do a sample uh, drawing. I went out into my garden and picked all these um, really beautiful flowers. So we'll play around with something really pretty today. Um, so that's sort of the plan for today's lesson. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about um, kind of where color theory comes from and a little bit about impressionism and what tonalism is and the differences between them and how they were invented. I promise that will not be super geeky and lectury, um, more just like, what do you use this stuff for? We'll talk about gamut, which is sort of, think of gamut as all the things your colors can do um, and how to discover what it is and how to enjoy it. Um, there may be some color swatching, so you will actually discover that's quite fun. Um, and we'll talk about how to show three dimensionality and shape and form with color and how to make colors pop. Um, and just, I may hit this again at the end of the lecture, but I wrote up a little page here. Um, the week after that and after that, we'll talk about perspective and ellipses, not the grammatical kind. Um, uh, and we'll do a little bit, a little intro into conceptual and imaginative drawing. Last week, some of you asked me for books on conceptual and imaginative drawing. And I must say that I think they're in my locker at the Art Center. I will continue to research the ones I love and post them to the Google Classroom. Um, when you make artwork, you can share it on the Google Classroom. Fanny usually enters the Google Classroom code at this point. Um, I don't know where my little card is. Um, and you can also share on Instagram at PAAC at home. You can send it to my attention at Ann McMillan Art and at the Palo Alto Art Center. All right. And that, for, some, for, for a few latecomers, can you just quickly put up the paper where you had today's lesson and just recap that super quick for the people who are only just joining us? Thank you. We have two new people on. Today's color lesson. We'll do two color wheels, compare and contrast them. I have put out a set of colored pencils. Um, I think last week I said you can bring colored pencils, you can do this. It'll be hard to do it with markers. Um, you can do it with colored pencils, you can do it with watercolor pencils, or just a kit like this, which is essentially like a children's watercolor kit. You can do it with a fancy watercolor kit. Um, uh, just for the record, if anybody's watching this in the future, um, these are some of my favorite watercolor kits. Uh, if you wanted to buy a bigger set, like double this set would be sort of convenient. I like to travel with just this small set because this is sort of my traveling kit. So these have what, um, 12? Um, so Fiber-Castell is a lovely watercolor pencil set. Um, Derwent, these are watercolor pencils. These Derwent ink tents are sort of turbo watercolor pencils, and we have found that we love them. Ink tents, uh, Teresa's on the call, and she is a um, connoisseur of art supplies, and she sort of introduced us to these ink tents pencils. They really are super intense pigment, and they're very fun to use. Um, so I'll show you those. When you're buying colored, pe colored pencils, I would really recommend that you just buy watercolor pencils, because when you buy watercolor pencils, you get two media for one. You get watercolors and pencils. And you get even something even better than that. You get this sort of high, hybrid media that you can use in both ways in the same painting. It can be really lovely. So um, I see lots of people are chatting. Let me bring the chat window up uh, just so I can see what's going on. Um, I try to keep a little eye on it, but I mainly let Fanny respond because uh, I'm busy talking and drawing. So I just wanted to put those out there. They're super fun to have. I personally have sort of a, I'm having a 
buy nothing quarantine. So I'm not really ordering anything right now. And that's one reason I'm trying to present these classes um, with the sort of main theme that you will simply um, use what you already own. Um, so for, I also put this out, I was scrambling around in my book library this morning and I found this book that I have never used, but I gotta say, if you really want to do a deep dive into understanding color, um, I got to say this is an awesome book. I really recommend it. Um, if you really want to understand color from the inside, I, I got to say that all of the exercises are stellar. Um, so I recommend this book. It's actually printed on watercolor paper, which makes it truly a workbook that you can use. So I'll put it on my Google Classroom. So you can look it up. Um, pretty much any color theory book is always fun. Here's another one. This one I thought was sort of too dense, but it also has really great ideas in it. Um, and I also found this one. And again, with all of these, I'm going to put them um, on my Google Classroom for further viewing. Uh -huh. And this is sort of a preview. This is, I need to let my camera focus. Sorry. Focus. Um, this is a picture of gamut. This is essentially a color swatch chart that we'll do next week together. Um, so if you want to work ahead, you can probably understand that pretty well. I'll also, if you want to print this out ahead of time, it's perfectly easy to draw it. Um, but if you want to print it out ahead of time, I'll put a printable up on the Google Classroom. All right. But today's exercise, it's really easy to just draw today's exercise. So you just need to pick up a pencil or a waterproof pen like this, and you're going to draw two circles. One like this, and one like this. I'm just checking that you can see my hands and my work. Maybe I like it more like that. Okay. So often I've noticed, um, and I can sort of tell by the homework people submit, some people just draw what I'm drawing, some people draw their own things, some people doodle while I talk. Today's might be a little bit more of a, of a um, sorry, my camera just fell down, um, of a do while I talk. And I will probably do one of these color wheels in watercolor and one of these colors in pencil. Um, but you can use one media for both. I'm simply going to demonstrate both because I'm assuming some of you are using one media and some of you are using another. So, the way I color mix, I have arrived at um, because I love color and because I love the Impressionists. And so what I have discovered over time is that there are some, some people who love and base their colors um, essentially on this technique called the grise, where they modify their colors by choosing a color and then adding black and white. But I like to modify my colors by choosing a color and adding another color and using a very, very high, um, high intensity color system. So what I'm gonna show you here is this way of mixing color that is called, um, what do you call this? It's six primaries called split primary or something like that. And essentially what I'm gonna do is have two primaries of each one. So two yellows, two reds, two blues, and I'm gonna do two color wheels with each one. So I'm gonna do a light color wheel and a dark color wheel. So this one's gonna be light primaries and dark primaries. Now, I'm sure some of you are looking at your kit right now and saying, oh, but I don't have an extra yellow. If that's your case, just jump this yellow over and use it in two places. So say you're lacking one of the blues or yellows, just use it in the other place. You'll still see the effect. Um, if you don't have a true pink or magenta, um, it's going to be tough because one of the problems people have is that they see this light red and it makes a brown purple. So we'll talk about that when we get there. I'm gonna put this one back in. Um, so then all you really have to do is essentially fill in the blank. 
and this is sort of just here's my uh, let's see I'm gonna do yellow yellow red red blue blue and this may feel a little elementary school to you but it pretty quickly becomes uh, a lot more than elementary school so these are what you call secondaries and then in between them tertiaries you guys still with me all right well good there's the classroom code i didn't know ink tests work great for monotype that's good to know one of these days i'm going to cave and become a printmaker all right so there's my tertiaries and i'm going to fill in all these little bubbles it's a little bit of work but it's so worth it to see what you get so i want to stick to my plan and these are my dark primaries these are my light primaries is everybody cool with what their equipment works for you you have the idea of which ones are dark and which ones are light i'm reaching back here to pull out a brush as well so let me just get started so the colored pencil people can be off and running So keep in mind that these, all of these ones are going to have at least a little bit of yellow. See this one too, right? Just a little bit here, not much. And then blue, a little bit here, a lot there, a little bit there. half here and a little bit there so if you want to um, run some numbers it's going to be 50 75 25 right does that make sense maybe i need to write that bigger 100 percent 50 percent um 25 75 so it's a ratio game. Here's the red one. So this one's 75-25. This one's 50-50. This is the purple. This one's going to be just a little bit of red and a little bit of blue and lots of blue. This one's all blue, a lot of blue and a little bit of yellow, 50-50, and so on and so forth. So let me take the red through here too, because then this one will essentially be done. That one's done. Um, let me go and do the other one too. Then maybe I'll just do a third one in watercolor while you guys catch up. I gotta say, I do not like the pencil because it gets all smudgy. Um, here. Pencil smudge is too much for me. Oh. Not that one. It's important to do two um, because when we get this done, you're going to see how different they are. In this case, I'm sort of pretending that my orange is a yellow. You just have to believe with me. So, this is half and half, and this is a little blue, all blue. So my blue is almost black in this case lots of blue it's still on my screen there we go from blue and a little bit of blue lots of orange half of orange notice sometimes you have to come back and redo just to balance it out um let's keep going this way half blue a little bit of blue red Half, lots, half, a little bit, um, some, lots. All right.
So uh, at this point, you maybe have one done or maybe one and a half done. Um, so maybe I'll just let you guys work for a minute and I'll very sweetly and happily do um, one in watercolor just for anybody who's working in watercolor. And I really want to show you guys the watercolor technique. Um, so if you're working in watercolor, you might want to perk up your ears at this point. Um, and if we're, you're working in colored pencil, you might want to just happily color in colored pencils until they are perfect, which is what colored pencil people do. Um, so I'm going to do one, and I only have to wet my dark primaries. So let's see, here's a dark primary. I'm not going to use the purple because it's already a secondary. I don't want to use a secondary, I want to use a dark primary. And I'm going to use this dark yellow right here. Can you see them? I see a little lag in my camera. Um, so I'm going to start with yellow again. Here's my yellow. And I need a little bit of yellow here, a little bit of yellow here. It'll be half yellow here. And half yellow here. All right. Am I moving too fast or too slow? When you chat, I can see your responses pretty clearly. Um, let me do a little bit of labeling here. Um, this is going to be green. This will be blue. This will be purple. Red. And orange. So be careful not to use the secondaries that your palette offers you. You're, the whole point of this exercise is to mix. Oh, good. I got a little feedback. The whole point of this exercise is to mix the colors yourself and to learn something about what your colors can do once you know how to use them. Um, all right. So then I've pretty much put all the yellow I'm going to need. Then I move on to my dark red. Here's my red in its pure form. And because these are pretty cheap watercolors, they're not very strong, so I go back and I um, pick up more and just add a lot of pigment to kind of make up for the fact that they're not very strong. Then I make an orange red and I make an orange. I add a little bit more red to that orange red just to make it really pop. And I do have to put a little bit here, but I think I'm going to have to temper it so it really does look yellow orange, not, not halvesy halvesy. Maybe add a little bit more yellow. So that's that's one complete. Uh, then I'm going to bounce over back to the blue. And I'm using a pretty dark blue because I'm doing a dark primary. That's a pretty blue. There's a dark one. Notice that when you're watching me watercolor, see how often I dip my brush and tap my brush. That is key to watercolor. And if you want to be a good watercolorist, this is pretty much the key to it. When I want to change colors, I dip, tap, dip, tap. Um, it's really, really crucial to work very, very clean when you are working in watercolor. And so all that sort of obsessive dipping and tapping that's hard to get through the video screen <laughs> is actually good practice for watercolor painting. Um, so I'm actually demonstrating something to you that should make your life better in the long run. Um, uh, <laughs> as you come in, uh, as you do this, um, your paper towel will get saturated and yucky. Just turn it and get some fresh paper towel. Um, let's do another one. So red to blue. Red to, yeah, so I need half red and half blue. And I'm also going to have to put some right here. A little bit here, a little bit here. And here we're getting the what's up with purple question answered. I need a little bit in this one. Okay. 
that looks pretty nice. Seems pretty balanced. Um, now I'm going to come back to the watercolor pencils and to the colored pencils. And here is where all of you who have um, colored pencils are going to discover that you want to press the magic button and buy watercolor pencils. Just let me show you what they can do. They're really lovely. Um, I'm just going to melt half so you can see the difference. Notice, just like with the watercolors, I always dip and tap between touching the colors. Um, because if I just jump from puddle to puddle, I will neutralize the puddles as I move around the water, the circle. So notice that when I um, melt the watercolor pencils, essentially with the water, um, this one's kind of too small. Um, what I get is actually a darker result. And that's simply because I fill the paper in. Notice that where it's dry, the paper sort of glimmers through, and I didn't fill the divots in the paper with the watercolor pencils. So there's this sort of darkening effect. When I'm um, figure drawing or drawing anything really, um, I actually love this because I'll often just wash in the shadow sides of figures um, with a paintbrush when I'm figure drawing. And I get this really beautiful sort of auto effect. All right, has anybody ordered um, Derwent Inktense watercolor pencils off Amazon yet? <laughs> yeah, the, um, yeah, if you have watercolor pencils, you just melt them with water. And if you have colored pencils, you layer them softly over each other. Um, there are lots of beautiful books on making watercolor or making plain old colored pencils look really, really beautiful. Um, it's something people who are um, really perfectionist love to do. Um, and so hence it has not appealed to me at any point in my life. I'm much more of a slapdash sort of artist, although there are things I can get pretty obsessive about, like dipping my brush and washing it, um, simply because I like bright color. Um, I find that any watercolor pencils mix with any other watercolor pencils. Um, I don't worry too much that I'm using Derwent's here and Faber Castell's there. Um, but they look really lovely. There you have it. Um, so now that I've done three of them, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about um, what's different about them. And this is actually really, really cool. Like here in this dark primaries. So in the dark primary world, um, it kind of looks a little old masters. maybe moody, maybe rainy even, like a rainy day color set. Um, something that's really interesting here is we mixed a cold, um, dark, maybe even um, reddish blue with a bright orange. And not surprisingly, we got a brown. Um, because the yellow we used has a lot of red in it, because it's essentially an orange, when we mix it with something that's almost a purple, we get a brown, because both of our dark primaries have a lot of red. So when you mix them together, you're actually mixing three primaries together, and hence you get this brown. Um, so when you're mixing up purples, and you're like, wow, I can't get a clean purple, you need to look at the primaries you're using and make sure that you really have a pinky red so true purple requires a pinky red and a pretty blue like that one, or a pretty blue like that one, um, and a true blue. Um, here, I can, can make a pretty purple for you. So something like these two colors. Uh, here, let me just do a little swatch. That one, and that one. That should result in a pretty good purple. 
Um, I could start spouting off the names of, of various pigments that make real purples, but I think your eyes would glaze over and you would start asking me, wait, what was that one? Um, instead, it's sort of better to just discover it for whatever materials you happen to own. Um, oh, this is a very pretty one. And we'll talk a little bit more about next week about gamut and how you do that, because that's sort of inside that world. You know, you can also do it sort of automagically the other way. Um, if you take an orangey red, like this one, and you lay it over with this one they're calling deep indigo. And you're you falling on it. the bottom. Oh, sorry. There we go. And also, can you... Give an example of what's not a true blue. Would that be like a phthalo blue or cerulean blue? Well, yeah, like a greenish blue will give you a yucky, a yucky red. I'm just doing one right now, like this indigo and this cadmium red will give you a blue or a brown, like a reddish brown in this case. Um, so I'm just trying to mix up some different ones. Let's see, this one is that one and how's it? Are you still on the on the thing? There you go. So those are a whole bunch of different reds. You should just play with what you have and discover where your pretty pinks are. Um, I wanted to also say something about this one. So this one has sort of more modern colors, and it's also sunny and bright. So you can make these choices when you're making um, when you're making paintings. I think, yeah. So when you're making paintings, you get to choose this stuff, whether you want this palette or this palette or some mix of the two. Because um, this is a very modern sort of palette and this is a very muted palette. Um, this one literally does look like kindergarten because it's done with a kindergarten palette. Um, <laughs> It's kind of neat. But notice this purple here. Wow, that's brown. And that's because this is orange. That's a very orange red. So when you use an orange red, you get a brown. Um, and all that is really kind of cool. There are lots of times you're going to need a brown. It's a good way to get one. Hey. Any questions at this point? <laughs> Let's see, blues that are not true blues. Um, you know, I think all blues are blue. And I think that my point is more that some blues are greeny blue, some blues are purple blue. Um, and you just have to think about what kind of blue you have, whether it's, um, whether it's on, you know, this side of the color wheel, or whether it's on that side of the color wheel. Um, and this is actually a good segue to a page that I marked in my book. Um, because I looked for a good color wheel, like an actual color wheel to show you guys. And it's in my locker at the Art Center. Um, so I brought one. This, I found one in a book. This is a really beautiful color wheel. And this is a split primary color wheel, which is what we just did with our two different color wheels. You'll notice there's a dark blue and a light blue, a dark yellow and a light yellow, a dark red and a light yellow. And they're showing you how they mix, how you can mix a really beautiful palette with the two of them together. Whereas if you mix with just three primaries, which you can certainly do, I painted that way for three or four years when I was a young painter, but I found that the paintings were really dull. And so as soon as I added this, six primary method, it worked so much better and the colors were so beautiful. Um, I don't want to flip the book on camera, but I want to flip the book, so I'm going to take it off camera because <laughs> I had another page mark. Ah, here we go. This, I don't know, is it coming into focus without shine? Okay, this thing is so brilliant. So this is all the standard pigments set on a color wheel um, with their names given, like a lizard and crimson, Windsor violet, and how they fit into the color wheel. Um, if you're interested in this level of geekiness, maximum geekiness, it's in this Exploring Color book.
and it's in a lot of other color books too. Um, the person who pretty much did it best, and he, you can find his work online, um, he made something called the Quiller Wheel. That's his name. He's an artist and author of art books. Um, and he did this where he set all the pigments into the place they go on the color wheel. I thought it was brilliant. Um, my copy of it hangs in the art studio at the Public Art Center. Um, so today's color mixing, we went around the block on what's up with um, the color purple. So now we have sort of mixing around the color wheel and why is that important? Um, this is where I really wish I had my color wheel. So maybe we'll just use, maybe I'm gonna have to make one. Um, the whole mixing around the color wheel is, is key for um, painting colorist paintings. And I may actually defer this topic to next time because I feel like I need a really good color wheel. Um, and I feel like the book is not coming into focus. Um, so I think I'm going to show it to you with a painting rather than show it to you with a book that's not in focus. Um, but the idea is that colors have value, right? Um, and I can show this to you with just a basic watercolor kit. It's kind of a beautiful idea. So I want you in your mind to turn, your, the, turn the color you're looking at through your screen, turn the color on and off and look at it with just, um, with just grayscale, sorry, brain fart. Um, do you see how the purple is almost black and the dark red is near black? The yellow is near white. The light green is near white. I, once again, we bounce back to a really dark color. This is a dark green. Again, back up to a light, light blue. Um, back down to a really, almost a black. So when you're using color to mix value, that's actually a really helpful idea. Um, and it's something I use a lot in my own personal painting. And it's something you can use um, to show value when you're painting. Um, it's, it's pretty much the nicest thing about painting and it's the thing I love the most when I'm painting um, for my own practice. Um, I use it all the time. So something that's really difficult when you're watercolor painting, um, you can see it here too in this sort of fancier kit. Um, so the, these are my schminky watercolors. And you can see that if you were to imaginatively turn off the light and dark, this is almost white, but my purple, my dark blue are almost black, right? And in between here, this is a gray, this is a gray, this is a gray, this is almost black. Um, you can also notice that, you know, here I have a light yellow, a dark yellow, a light red, a dark red, a uh, light blue, a dark blue. Um, so I have the same split complementary or split primary system that I have just demonstrated to you. Um, so the watercolors are really lovely for this. Um, and so are the colored pencils. You can do it with them as well. So we were just looking at these. But do you see how I said, you know, choose a light primary and a dark primary? You can actually start showing light and dark with your colored pencils. Um, so rather than, let me just do a little demo drawing instead of keeping on yakking. Um, rather than doing something like this, where you take a pen, let me find a pen. I think I'd be better prepared. I knew this was going to happen. Um, and doing a little drawing. My little fake drawing or a pencil. So this is a very classic, almost medieval way to draw, where you do a, a black and white drawing, and then you essentially haze your really valuable colors over the top, and you make it colorful with very little pigment. It's I find it difficult to do. And I also find the result dull. But for many, many centuries, this is the way painting was accomplished. It's just to add just enough pigment that it looks colorful. 
because pigment was really, really expensive and very difficult to come by. This is a really bad example. Um, but it's a process called, I don't know if I can even spell it right, Grisai. If some, if one of you students knows French better than me, you can correct the spelling. But the idea is that you do a grayscale painting and then you um, put washes of color over it and give it its color with the washes of color. Um, and kind of the more washes you put, the more colorful it looks. Vermeer did this a lot um, because paint was handmade um, in his studio. It's really difficult to come by paint. The sort of impasto effects you see with the Impressionists happened because all of a sudden paint was being made by uh, factories and stores rather than being made by the, by the artists inside their studios. So it just became something that's easier to create. So there's a little grisaille picture for you. I write that better. And it's very much value with the color on top. It's a very classical way to paint. Now, the way I prefer to paint, I'm going to do another one. And after this, we'll have enough with the boring, and I'll do a picture of a real flower. Um, is to think about the color's sort of intrinsic value. So I would say that this red is a mid-tone. Right? If you turned its color on and off. And this yellow is light. Um, this, this red here can be a dark. So you see, all of a sudden, I'm thinking about the colors not as colors but as values and this indigo blue is a super dark okay you guys ready so i'm using them as a gray scale instead of i'm literally using the color as a gray scale which is a bizarre idea but one that I really love. And it's sort of foundational to this idea of colorism and using color to create form instead of value to create form. But you're not really, you're simply using the intrinsic values of the colors to create form. So, um, you can, what you will sort of create is something that looks a little bit like an apple because I'm using sort of red as my midtone, but you could certainly create anything. Like if you wanted, to draw a lime, you would simply use green as your mid-tone. Um, so here I am creating something that looks round by using the intrinsic values. So here I am with the dark. Um, this gets to be the super dark. Maybe it casts a little bit of a shadow, but not all of the shadow. And notice as I draw, this is sort of a meta drawing idea. I'm not drawing the shadow or the shape. I just draw anything that needs this value. I'm not really like defining this or that. Um, as soon as you start drawing or painting, you stop thinking about coloring inside the lines. So then this adds a light side. And notice that things are getting pretty complex pretty fast. I can add a little bit of reflected light with it if I want. Um, and then I can use a completely other color for the, for the ground. If you were in previous classes, you, you know that I have to include this since I'm shape drawing. There has to be some ground in the shadow because it doesn't stop at the edge of the shadow. Maybe I'm going to draw a little box around each one. OK, so this and this. Same drawing, but one is created with black and white with color washed on top, and one is simply created with color. I think it's kind of clever. I also think it's really, really fun to do. So when I'm teaching, I tend to teach this, but I teach that as well, just so that you know what you're doing. 
um, and you can choose what you want to do. This is not to diss this way of painting. It's a very remarkable way to paint and done well, it results in a really beautiful result. I'm not very good at it and I'm not patient enough for it. Um, so those are sort of um, the way to talk about it. Next week, I'm going to talk about mixing around the color wheel, which you'll notice I did right here, right? I went from yellow to blue. I mixed around the color wheel. So to do this little picture, I went from yellow, let me do it here. I went from yellow is the light, and I went all the way around the color wheel through red to this color, all the way to blue. You might say I went all the way this way. Um, so the whole mixing around the color wheel is super powerful. Um, and next week I'll find a real color wheel somewhere and I'll have it on screen and we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, sorry I didn't have one this week. Okay. Any questions at this point? You guys can can give a little feedback via text if you wish. Um, well, we have 33 people on the call. That's terrific. Um, so are you guys ready for a real drawing? And I'm going to do it with this method. Um, and I want to do it um, with the view you can see. I'm glad you guys like the demo. That's nice. Um, and just to, to revisit the whole idea that purple can snag you, I'm actually going to include this sort of hot pink rose from my garden. It's actually one of my grandmother's roses. Um, Let's see if I want one of these too. Let's see, do, do we have time for that one too? How much time do we have? Oh my gosh, I gotta paint fast. Okay, I'm gonna paint fast. And I wanna paint what you guys can see, so let's make it interesting. Maybe I'm just gonna do that and that. How's that? Paint fast. Here we go. So if you've been on this call before and you've watched these lessons before, you'll know that there's supposed to be a whole bunch of, I'm going to size, I'm going to decide what the picture is going to be like, I'm going to do some contour drawing and some gesture sketching. But today, I, because we have 10 minutes left, I'm just going to draw. Um, and in much more of like a, the way I would paint this painting, which is sort of a smear of color, and I'll fix it later. Um, so here we go. Something that colorists do is use the pigment just the way it is, straight up out of the tube. So in this case, straight up out of my pen. Um, something that I can do that is also very colorist is to layer over another beautiful color. Um, and there are these really beautiful little um, spiky things here. I'll put those in. Um, and then I actually foolishly edited out all my greens so that I wouldn't get confused and use them during my demo. So let me get my pencil box back out because I don't really want to mix greens on camera because we don't have time. Um, so underneath the flower, uh, it's dark, right? Right here. Um, and then underneath this flower, it's also a little bit dark. Um, and then it gets lighter. So notice that this combo of light and dark color, just light and dark green, light and dark red, light and dark yellow, it's really fast and it's really powerful for showing um, three-dimensionality. So even though this may not be the exact right green or the exact right red or the exact right yellow, if you're sort of in the ballpark, your viewer never has to know. Like when Julia Child dropped the salmon on the floor of the kitchen, she just looked at the camera and said, if you're alone in the kitchen, 
they won't ever know. So the person who looks at your drawing doesn't have to know that this might not have been the right green. Um, if you're doing a science illustration, you probably should make it right. But otherwise, um, to my mind, making it look three-dimensional is sort of key. So here's the sort of purple question, right? We, this is really truly purple, and we don't want it to just be pink. That's no fun. Gonna rise to the level of the challenge. This is kind of a funky drawing because I keep looking here with my eyes coming at my desk, and I also keep looking at my MacBook where you're looking at my face, and I keep forgetting which one I'm looking at. Um, one of the meta drawing skills is to remember where your eyes are and not move your eyes. Um, because as soon as you're moving your eyes, you're drawing a different picture. Um, let's see, here's a very pretty blue. This is what I would sort of call a pure blue, not a blue that is um, greenish or reddish, but a blue that is pretty primary. If you really want a true blue, you can buy something called cyan, cyan, so C-Y-A-N. And it's truly meant to be as close to physically pure, bright, light blue, like literally physical light um, primary. Okay, um, what else can we do for this thing? So keeping up around with the idea of moving around the color wheel, if I choose a darker red, um, then I can put in some of these darks and sort of show more detail in the flower. You see all these pretty darks in here? You can show that with just a darker red. And you see how different that is from choosing a brown or a black? A brown and a black sort of kills the buzz. Um, and I actually almost never use a brown or black in my drawing because I don't want to kill the buzz. Um, I would prefer to use a rich blue or a rich red if I wanted something even darker. And that's what a colorist would do. That's what um, Mr. Monet would do in between smoking cigarettes. Um, I went to the Monet show in Denver kind of just because I'm stubborn was really, really fun. And then because these are watercolor pencils, they can do the magic. And something that's really fun with watercolor pencils is you don't have to melt everything. You can just melt sort of judiciously. And that is, can create really charming pictures. I feel like down here, there's some really pretty darks that I'm not using. Something that's also charming about watercolor pencils is you can use them dry into wet puddles and they sort of melt on the fly, which is fun. Since this is really dark, I would probably melt that stuff. Notice that I do tend to melt the stuff that is dark and not the stuff that is light. So this all deserves a little bit of melting. Um, I can show some definition in the flowers, the melting, but I don't have to melt everything. It would look sort of dead if I did. I kind of like this little bit that I melted, so I'm going to think about melting over here, but not too much. Okay, that's a little bit about color. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> um, notice I didn't put the shadows in. Um, I could do that, but I don't think I need to. Um, I could pretend we're outside instead and put in a cute little bee. Definitely needs wings. Uh, any favorite artist to study? That's a very good question. That was the wrong pencil. 
wrong time. There we go. We'll be. Um, let's see. There are lots of suggestions on my Google Classroom for artists I love. Um, you know, I super duper, duper love Monet. Um, super duper, duper. Such a high school thing to say. Um, not anymore, of course. Uh, <laughs> um, let me think. Certainly, um, let's see, for watercolor, like Sargent did these really beautiful watercolors that are very based on this idea of turning the form with the color. Um, I'll think about some more colorists as well to list on my site if you want to study colorism in general. Because this whole lecture is based on this idea of, um, of color and using colors as values. Um, so I'll, I'll check into that and put it on my, on my Google site. Um, let's see, what else can I say about this? I've got another good question on the chat. Let's see. Would you put in a background? How would you do that without completing the drawing? Oh, that looks fun. Um, something you could do, um, sort of imagining the outside world would be sort of fun like this. Um, often when I'm doing a little sort of vignette piece like this, I would give the bee a little bit of space. And I happen to know that these have these like really neat leaves. I didn't bring any in, but um, they have sort of a basil rosette, I guess you would call that. Um, so I might put the leaves in. I'd probably have to go out and get them because I'm like that. Um, but you could also do this. You could also um, make these little flary lines into a wash like that um, so that maybe they, maybe they don't look quite so intrusive. I like giving the bee a little bit of air space, maybe giving the flowers a little bit of air space. This kind of idea of air space is a lot like the, um, the line work we did where we're like, if you leave space in the lines, you get a sense of distance um, and you can do that here too. That's a very yellow green. It's kind of a more yellow green than I expected. Um, I thought that one of the things we would talk about next week is atmospheric perspective. And right now I'm sort of jumping ahead into that. But as things get farther ahead, they become more blue, or farther away, they become more blue. So if I want to push it back, because that's a really, this yellow green is really hot, I can add a little bit of blue. And it'll push it back into space a little bit. It's also a very hot blue, so I'm not making it better. You can tell that I don't understand these materials. I'm picking up at random here very well. I understand my um, my pastels, my acrylics, and my oils much, much better. But I'm kind of enjoying my buy nothing policy right now. Maybe something like that. Thank you. I have to go out and get the leaves, so I'm not going to do that part. Um, isn't that kind of nice, though? Kind of imagining the outside world. Any other good questions? Oh, a quick sunset color sketch. <laughs> well, that sounds kind of fun. Um, I'm going to put that aside. Um, Let's see, watercolor or a colored pencil? Watercolor would be much faster. Colored pencil takes a while and is, I must consider that you guys must get tired of hearing it clank against itself. Um, whoa, bring out the big guns. Um, I always wish I had fancy brushes, but I never, every time I wanna buy one, I sort of flinch away. From, from actually pressing the button. Um, let's see what I can do. You know, Georgia O'Keeffe painted these really beautiful, very vibrant little watercolors. They're like six by eight. And obviously she just would go for a walk. Uh, she'd go for a hike around her house and do a little watercolor. And she did something very clever with them. 
um, where she would just swirl the colors together. Um, can't get my color to, to pooch up. Wake up. She would swirl the colors together and just leave space between them so that she didn't have bleed problems. There we go, it's waking up. Um, and that worked really well for her. And it was, it was, um, they're, they're so vibrant and beautiful. And if you wanna see a colorist at work, she's kind of a good one. Um, you don't really think of her that way. Um, but those little watercolors are remarkable. So I wanna take my sponge brush and stop using this dark blue and start using a different color. Um, so I had to wash it really well. So I just went and did that. Um, as always with every class, I have a giant pile of paper towels pre, pre ripped and pre torn. Um, I rip my paper towels into floors. So I guess red sky at evening. We're doing here. I guess my lights dry the paint out really fast. Something I do before I start watercolor painting, um, which you're seeing me do now because I'm getting frustrated with how slowly the paint's coming up to speed, is sort of reset. I, I drip a lot of paint in all the, in all the buckets. Um, and if I had known I was gonna actually do this, I would have done it ahead of time so that it's already paint. This idea that you have to scrub at your paints is actually not very fun. Um, your paints should already be paint when you start painting with them. There we go, it's getting better. Notice we get the brown effect here because of the two blues, or the blue and the red we have chosen, I have chosen. Um, so I'm actually doing a what's called a wet and wet um, graduated wash sort of by accident. I'm kind of making my way through my, through my beautiful schminky palette. Okay. Hope I'm not embarrassing myself too badly here. I just drove over Skyline a few days ago and um, there was this beautiful tule fog all caught in the little valleys um, on Alpine Road. It was so fundamentally beautiful. Oh. I put my fingers here and I deposited oil on the paper. So when you are watercolor painting, don't do that. It's resisting right there. Interesting. Um, uh, let's go over here and see what, see, let, see what thalo blue and interesting greens can do for us. If you are just starting to paint, I recommend against anything that has a pH and a TH in it. Um, just because the thalos are so such strong stains that they're difficult to work with. Um, and they'll make your life difficult. And your life will all of a sudden be thalo blue. So will your painting. I don't know, something like that. Let me pull it back onto the screen, sorry. The reason it has some intrinsic need to walk off the bottom. Um, to me, it needs more stuff up here. Here's where I gotta wash my brush again because I wanna blend, but not with green. Okay, that's enough of that. What do you think? 
Hi, Sunny. All right. Anyway, it's all in good fun. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, let me write down quickly things I said I would do to the Google Classroom because I find after class is over, I can't remember. Um, let's see, conceptual art books. Um, anybody else want to text in stuff I said I would say? Work on for you? Okay, throwing this pen away. And other than that, I think we're done for the day. Um, let me just revisit uh, what we're doing next week. Um, so next week we will talk about gamut and we'll go into color wheels and talk a little bit more about colorism and impressionism and how to show shape with color. We'll also talk a lot about uh, analogous colors because they're so fun and they're pretty much why colors pop. Um, and then the week after that and the week after that, we'll talk about perspectives and ellipses and then an introduction to conceptual and imaginative drawing. If you want to share your work on Instagram, the tag is PAAC at home. And you can also use the handles if you want me to look at it, um, Anne McMillan Art and Palo Alto Art Center um, to our attention. That flags us in Instagram. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, and then other than that, I will write down things I said I would do. Um, and that was load up color swatches pages to Google, conceptual art books, which I failed to find this week, colorist artists for you to look at. Anything else? So I'll put all these up on Google Classroom for you. All right. I'm trying to think of anything else I said I would go off and do. Um, I'll also, um, I kind of see a materials list for this class shaping up. Our materials recommendations, and I'll put that up there too. All right. All right. I think with that, we're probably done. You can always email me or talk to me through my website. Um, pretty much everything I do online is Anne McMillan art, my YouTube channel. Sorry, talking. My YouTube channel, my Instagram account, my URL, everything's Anne McMillan art. All right. Terrific. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to have you back in class. And if you're a newbie, thanks for joining.